All right, Nam Bulavanaka, everyone. For those of you who are tuning in to this live stream from the Fiji National University Facebook page, uh, and also we're streaming also on uh, FNU's YouTube uh, platform. Uh, this, uh, we've got our four panelists with us today, and uh, we will begin in about four minutes at 12.45. So don't go anywhere, uh, stay there, we'll come back on at 12.45. Naka. Okay, uh, greetings again, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to today's uh, panel discussion, Explain the Science, and this is our second in this series. Uh, this is organized by the Fiji Institute of Pacific Health Research at the College of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences of the Fiji National University. And uh, this is really to primarily address the questions and the concerns that are being raised by members of the public uh, through various social media platforms about COVID-19 and in particular about vaccination, about testing and other issues. So as we uh, in Fiji battle the second wave of this COVID-19 infection, uh, many of our members are expressing uncertainty uh, and we hope to be able uh, to provide a platform uh, for these concerns to be addressed and discussed openly. Uh, by providing these uh, series of Q&A forums with the different panelists over the next few weeks. Today we have uh, invited uh, four who are on our panel uh, with us today. 
Uh, and um, I'll, I'll start just quickly introducing them. Uh, Professor Peter McIntyre is a pediatrician specializing in infectious diseases and vaccines, and is also qualified as a public health physician. Uh, before moving to Dunedin, New Zealand in 2018, he was the director of Australia's National Center for Immunization Research and Surveillance based in Sydney, and since 2019 has been a member of the World Health Organization Strategic Advisory Group of Experts, SAGE, for vaccines. He's currently a professor at the University of Otago, a medical advisor for New Zealand's IMAC, and a honorary professor at the University of Auckland. We also have Associate Professor James Asher, who is an immunologist and a clinical microbiologist at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Uh, and he's the director of the Webster Center for Infectious Diseases and Science Director of Vaccine Alliance Aotearoa New Zealand. He is a member of the New Zealand uh, government's COVID-19 vaccine science and te technical advisory group and was a member of the COVID-19 vaccine strategy task force. We also have Dr. Alicia Saukan, uh, who is no stranger to us in PG. Uh, she's an infectious disease epidemiologist and a public health physician. She is currently the head of health protection at the Fiji's Ministry of Health and Medical Services. She led the ministry's response to epidemics of meningococcal C in 2018 and measles in 2019 to 2020. Uh, the response included the vaccination of hundreds of thousands of Fijians, which was essential to ending both the epidemics. And more recently, as we know, she, she's been part of the ministry's uh, leadership team for Fiji's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, last but not least, we have Ms. Anna Rokomokoti. Anna is a lecturer of law at the Department of Law uh, at the College of Business uh, at the Fiji National University. Uh, she's, uh, she's a lawyer by profession. She's got a master's of law as well from Victoria University of Wellington. She's been a lawyer for, uh, she's got over 23 years of work experience. And she is also a, an accredited mediator with the Fiji Mediation Center. So uh, I'd like all of us to uh, once again, just welcome our four panelists uh, who are with us uh, today. I'll just quickly uh, ask the four of them uh, very briefly, maybe over two minutes or three minutes, just to give us some, uh, an overview of what they think uh, would be a great start to today's discussion. So I'll start with Peter. Uh, Peter, maybe if you could explain the benefits versus the risks of vaccination. Uh, you know, why is vaccination still being recommended despite the reports of adverse events and maybe even deaths? Oh, oh thank you very much, Donald. Well, uh, I guess there's three important things to say that um, COVID-19 is a severe disease, that we have very effective vaccines, including the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is the one that's being used currently in Fiji, and uh, the vaccines are safe and the benefits of um, being vaccinated um, in terms of protection from disease, both for the individual and uh, the community are far, far greater than any uh, potential risks um, that might be um, uh, associated with vaccination. Um, and so to take those three things sequentially, um, if you look at um, COVID-19 across the world, I mean, uh, in the last 12 months, there have been something like six times the number of deaths recorded from, uh, from COVID as are estimated to occur with influenza, uh, and that's an underestimate. And uh, influenza, of course, you know, unfortunately has uh, vaccines which are effective, but they're not nearly as effective as the ones that we have for COVID. So I think that's an incredibly good news story that, uh, you know, 12 months ago, we were wondering, will we have a vaccine? Um, will it work? Um, and, you know, our dreams have come true in the sense that we have vaccines that are, uh, are far better than we've been used to seeing for flu vaccines. And not only that, but uh, particularly the, uh, the people who flu vaccines, you know, have not worked so well for so older adults and adults who have other health conditions, uh, the COVID vaccines have been working uh, extremely well even for those people. And, and one of the things which is a little bit confusing is um, looking at the data about how the vaccines are operating. Uh, a lot of the time in the, in the original trials that were done because they involved primarily younger people who, you know, didn't have a lot of other health conditions. In fact, 
uh, the cases that were being prevented were not, uh, for the most part, very severe. So there were people who had flu-like illnesses, but there were very few hospitalizations and, and very few deaths, even putting all the vaccine trials together. Whereas now what we're able to see from big rollouts in countries like you know, the UK, the US, other parts of Europe, is that um, even if there are some gaps for the vaccines in terms of preventing any infection, including infections due to variants, that the vaccines are performing very, very well against protecting these severe cases, protecting against severe disease that might result in hospitalization or death. And, and that's, of course, what we really care about. Um, and that includes the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which, um, in fact, if you look just at the severe disease, the AstraZeneca vaccine is right up there in terms of its effectiveness um, compared to any of the other vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and so on. Um, uh, there are some differences with the milder cases, but if you're looking at the bad ones, um, the AstraZeneca vaccine is performing very, very well. And uh, the, the good news about safety, I think, is that, is that um, this rare uh, clotting problem, which was previously something which we just hadn't seen before, where you could get uh, clots in unusual places and actually have low platelets, which are the, you know, the sticky little things that initially start the clotting process. If you cut yourself, um, low numbers of platelets associated with having clots, which you know, is something which is really quite an unusual situation. Um, we now have good evidence that this you know, does occur um, uh, and it is related to the vaccine, but it is still very rare. And um, we're talking you know, one, maybe at the most two people in 100,000 um, experiencing this. And uh, compared to the sorts of risks that COVID represents, um, which we've been protected from in the Pacific, but um, we won't be protected from forever. And of course, the way out of all the restrictions and um, you know, difficult times that we've had to go through, and I know that's been the case for Fiji, the way, the way out of that is the vaccines. And so I think the overwhelming message is that the benefits of the vaccines greatly exceed the risks. Sure, vaccines are not 100% effective against preventing everything, and they're not 100% safe, but if you compare the benefits with the risks, it's really a very clear decision to make. Thanks, Donald. Thanks, Peter. That, that's very clear. Uh, James, over to you. Uh, Fiji uses, so uh, in regards to tests, um, we've got the PCR and uh, the uh, gene expert. Talk to us or, you know, talk to the person who doesn't understand science uh, about the two tests and why are these the best tests that we can use uh, for a diagnosis of COVID-19? Sure, thanks, Colin Bulavanaka. So uh, the tests that we use to detect the virus uh, are called uh, reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction is the, is the main one. There are some other methods that are in use, but they all, all the methods involve trying to detect the, uh, the genome of the virus. Um, and their the genome is an RNA uh, uh, genome. So uh, the RTP, the reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, or RT-PCR for short, I'll call it go, going forward, um, amplifies up specifically the, the genome of the virus in a sample. So it, it uses um, sequence specific, it recognizes the, the specific sequences in the genome of the virus and um, amplifies that up so it can be detected. And you can theoretically detect as little as one copy of the virus in a, in a, in a um, RT-PCR reaction. Now, as far as the different sorts of tests go, there are a variety of different uh, machines or platforms on which you can uh, test for the virus. Um, and, and the gene expert is, is one of them. Um, they're all though using exactly the same um, technology. Uh, they're all using uh, amplification of, of the genome um, and the, the, the gene experts using RT-PCR just like the um, other tests that are available in Fiji. Now these are the most, uh, the most sensitive tests. They can, as I say, they can detect as little as one virus um, in a sample. Um, and they are also uh, incredibly uh, specific or very accurate. So the uh, if you get a positive with the test, 
uh, you can be highly certain that there is, um, there is in fact virus present in that sample. Thank you, James, that was clear. Uh, Alicia, uh, over to you, I think. Um, so people are, I guess in Fiji with uh, the recent cases, I think there's just concern about the deaths that are happening. Uh, how are we sort of classifying, uh, I think the question here is how are we classifying a death as a COVID death, for instance? Um, what's the protocol that we're using? Um, thank you, Donald. Yes, uh, so in terms of the deaths um, from COVID-19, as you know, we have a high number of cases. So we're now uh, at about um, 60 cases uh, per day, which is, if you're looking at our population, that's about 68 per million population, which is a high number. To put that in context, neither Australia nor New Zealand got to this level of cases per day. What we have noticed though, is that we are not seeing that corresponding increase in severe cases and deaths yet. And I'm saying yet, because we do expect from to what, is, what we see around the world is that we will see that wave come in. So, so far during this outbreak, we've recorded two deaths that we've attributed to COVID-19. There were two deaths previously last year that um, were not part of this outbreak, but we've also um, had uh, six deaths that for people who tested positive for COVID-19, but they had pre-existing conditions that they were already in hospital for, that they were suffering from very severe illnesses that in the end, their doctor said that they died from these illnesses and not COVID-19. So as everyone in Fiji knows that our, our largest hospital, the CWM hospital, uh, has been affected by this virus. We've had an outbreak there. And unfortunately, it, the first wards that it hit were the acute medical wards. So these were the sickest, these are where the sickest people are managed. So they're already very sick. They have long-standing chronic uh, conditions that they're admitted for. And because there was an outbreak in the hospital, they also tested positive for COVID. Um, but their clinicians look at things like the symptoms that they had before they actually died looking at all their blood results, other investigations, and looking to see whether it correlates with a diagnosis of severe COVID, or it's more towards the disease that they were admitted for in the first place. So this could be things hypothetically like congested cardiac failure. So they're having heart failure already, and then they die. Or chronic renal disease, where their kidneys are failing because of longstanding diabetes, uh, for example. So this is what the clinicians look at, and we followed the WHO criteria as well. And then we can say that, no, it was not COVID that caused these deaths. It was the diseases that they were admitted for, these already very severe diseases. Thanks, Alicia. Thank you. Uh, and we've got Anna. Anna is a, um, a, a lawyer by profession, and she's on this panel because uh, I think we've had questions related to the right to vaccination. So Anna, maybe just uh, as a background, just talk about uh, a person's right as far as vaccination is concerned. Right, thanks Donald. Uh, I think it's a very important uh, question, uh, especially in light of what uh, the whole world is going through and Fiji in particular. For us, uh, our best reference point is the 2013 Fijian Constitution, which basically contains a Bill of Rights and part and parcel of that right is the right to freedom uh, from medical treatment without informed consent. So the requirements for that is uh, before an individual uh, gets or gives the go ahead or gives the consent, he, he or she needs to have the necessary uh, information, uh, medical, scientific, uh, in order to bring him to that place uh, of decision making on whether or not to consent. And of course, when you're talking about consent, you're talking about you need the consent to be made voluntarily and it has to be uh, born out of free will. So any consent that is uh, given under duress or coercion or threat or force or even fraud uh, affects the validity of that consent. So uh, that's probably something important to bear in mind. I also wanted to talk about the, the work of the public health officials. Uh, it's uh, definitely connected to the question. Uh, the public health officials, they carry out their work uh, in the hope and in the aim of uh, promoting and protecting the public interest. The public interest being the welfare and the well being of the society. Uh, so uh, you almost, uh, 
from a certain angle, you'd think that you have these two different positions sitting uh, on the opposite ends of the spectrum from each other. And then it's, it's uh, I suppose, uh, it's uh, frustrated with uh, uh, the the um, the notion that uh, there are some employers who are proposing that vaccination, uh, you know, that vaccination be received by their workers before they come back to work. But uh, the constitution is very clear on uh, the rights to certain freedoms, and in particular, the right to freedom from discrimination on the basis of health status, on the basis of circumstances, on the basis of conscience. So these are some of the things that uh, uh, we have to be uh, conscious of. And these are express written laws. And when you're talking about the express law, you're talking about the intentional will of parliament to create these laws and make sure that they continue. Uh, but having said that, uh, they, uh, it seems uh, when you consider those three positions, uh, to me, I would like to propose that the law permits a striking of balance, whereby the onus is on the actors to, to try and find that balance. And uh, when you talk about striking of balance, you, you're talking about an appreciation process where all parties need to uh, uh, consider the other position, the other person's position or the other party's position. And uh, in, in that, uh, it requires give and take here and there. But uh, having said that, I think it's also important to highlight that the constitution uh, gives an avenue for constitutional redress for those uh, individuals who, who, who consider that their rights have been contravened and they are, um, they are permitted by the constitution to go to the high court and seek constitutional redress. Of course, the court will have to look into their complaints and claims and uh, apply the relevant laws. And if fitting and if deserving according to law, the court will intervene and uh, will grant uh, declarations or reliefs or whatever remedies that is appropriate in the case. And also I, th I thought it was important to mention that you have the human rights, uh, human rights an anti-discrimination commission that is set up by the constitution. Uh, and they are also uh, uh, regarded as, uh, if I can say, the watchdog of human rights. So they, they are empowered according to law uh, and according to the Human Rights uh, Act, which is an en enabling legislation that basically empowers them to investigate. And uh, basically they are also even, um, uh, empowered to make recommendations to government as to the practice and the observance of human rights in Fiji. So those are some of the things I thought I'd share. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. I think that's, that's very clear. All right. So uh, we're getting in. Uh, so this is from the questions that we've received, and we'll just go around the table and just ask uh, several questions that we've been receiving. Again, uh, as uh, I had mentioned, or, or as is on the fly, if we can't answer all of your questions that are sent in, we'll ensure that those are captured in the next panel discussion, or we're going to start publishing the questions and their answers. Uh, so that people can read uh, the responses to the questions that you asked. Peter, back to you. Does a higher efficacy mean that a vaccine is better? Well, um, as, I, uh, as I mentioned, Donald, um, interpreting the trials, um, there is um, a little bit of confusion about you know, numbers that you would see in the newspapers, you know, 95% versus 84% versus 60%, etc. But I think I think the thing that we really need to focus on, and I think the thing that we would probably all agree is what really matters, is uh, effectiveness or efficacy in preventing severe disease. So that's the information which has only been emerging clearly from uh, use of the vaccines in large, you know, hundreds of millions of doses sort of numbers in countries which are having a lot more COVID than even Fiji is at the moment, and certainly than Australia or New Zealand have had. Um, and and the, the, the message from that, as I said, for the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is the one being used in Fiji, as for the others, has been that the vaccines are all performing very well um, and that protection against severe disease and death seems to be very similar. 
across all the vaccines. So although you will see different numbers, and obviously 95% sounds better than 85%, which sounds better than 70%, um, although there are these different numbers you'll see quoted, the, the really important number, which is how well are they protecting against severe disease, seems to be panning out to be very similar across the world. Thank you, that's clear. Uh, the next question may be to both James and Alicia, uh, and this has to do with the test and the test positivity rate. Uh, so I think a lot of Fijians will always be hearing Alicia in her press conferences or in the reports that we're getting is that the test positivity rate is, is reported. So maybe we'll start with you, Peter, uh, James, and, and you know, just talking about with, uh, with this PCR or uh, the test that we're doing for COVID-19, uh, the positivity rate that we're reporting, how, what is it? How important is it in terms of the progress uh, or the public health interventions that we have? Sure. Yeah, so the, the pos test positivity rate uh, is uh, a function of um, what proportion of all the tests that are done uh, come back positive, so uh, sort of self-explanatory, I guess, in, 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 in that sense. Um, it, if you've got a high, a high test positivity rate, which is uh, becomes of concern, um, that could be for two reasons. It could be either because uh, a high proportion, uh, there's a lot of infection in the community, or it could be because you're not doing enough testing. Um, so ideally, uh, what we would like to see is uh, the as infection comes under control um, and as uh, we're sampling in the community that we see that the, their, test, their test positivity rate is, um, is kept down because that means we're doing adequate sampling, we're testing enough people to know whether there's infection in the community and um, we're, uh, we're getting around the outside of who, who's got infection hopefully and, 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 and detecting it. And I would say that the, the test that's being used in Fiji is really the gold standard uh, test for uh, detecting, uh, detecting infection with, with COVID uh, that's used in uh, various parts of the world. So, I mean, I, I think um, uh, it can be very, people can be very confident of that. And I'll hand over to Alicia from a, a public health perspective. Yeah, thank you. So um, people have heard me in news press conferences tell, talking about the test positivity. When we started this, uh, so this is looking at an average of seven days. So our test positivity per day, looking at it over an average of seven days, it's a better measure to see what the trend is. So we started very low. It's about 0.2% of our, all our tests per day were testing positive. And now we've come up to 2%, um, which, is high, which is high. And as I mentioned before, the thresholds we're, we're using are WHO-based thresholds. So 2% and 5%. So... What the test positive, uh, positivity shows you, as James mentioned, is one, if your test positivity is increasing, that means you may not be testing enough. And when you say you're not testing enough, it means um, an example I like to give is New York City during the first wave last year. Their test positivity went up to 50%. But then you drill down and you actually look at who they were testing. They were testing mainly people who turn up to hospital who are very sick. So their, their um, likelihood of testing positive for COVID in the outbreak is very high. So they were only concentrating the testing on that proportion. As the outbreak went, um, went on and they expanded the testing, it started to come down because they were testing more and more people in the community who were less likely to have the disease, but also milder cases. So that came down. The other thing that can increase your test positivity is just if you have more cases, if you have increasing cases in the community, you have widespread community transmission. No matter how much testing you do, even if you're testing at a very high level, your test positivity will increase. So in Fiji, we are testing at a very high level. We are, um, we're averaging about 3,200 tests a day, which right now is sitting at about 3.6 per 1,000 population at a national level. And even down to the places where we have the outbreak, like the Suva area, it's at six per 1,000 population. So if you compare that to other countries, for example, right now, Victoria in Australia is having an outbreak, their testing is at the same level. It's between three and six per 1,000 population. So even though the absolute numbers are much more, so in Victoria, they're testing between, I think it's 20,000 to 45,000 samples a day. When you compare it to their population and we compare our testing to our population, it's actually at the same level. But our test positivity is increasing and now it's hit that threshold of 2%. So what that's showing us is that 
we just have in increasing numbers of cases in the community, that the cases are increasing despite high levels of testing. And without testing, if you look at who we're testing, we're testing the highest risk cases, so um, risk population, so the close contacts of cases, we're testing healthcare workers, we're testing highly mobile um, populations, people that have a lot of contacts like cashiers at supermarkets, police officers, and we're also testing in the community, so people who just turn up to screening clinics with symptoms. So we have a very broad um, category, a spectrum of testing, and we're still seeing that test positivity increasing. So that indication is that we are seeing increasing cases in community. There is community transmission, but we are still keeping up that high level of testing. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, Peter, to you, um, I, the, so I think there's, there's a lot of questions around the different kinds of vaccines and particularly uh, the, you know, AstraZeneca and Pfizer. So if a country like Australia is using both the vaccines, I think the questions are why we focused only on AstraZeneca. So maybe would you like to talk about the differences between the vaccines and maybe particularly if you have information, focus on the two, Pfizer and AstraZeneca? Uh, yes, thanks, Donald. Well, well the, um, uh, the Pfizer vaccine um, and the Moderna vaccine uh, both use this technology called messenger RNA, which, and messenger RNA is the sort of code, you know, James was talking about the, uh, the record, you know, using PCR testing to detect the code for the virus and diagnose the virus. Well, what the messenger RNA does is basically provide the template to make the protein um, so the body can see the protein on, on the viral surface and make antibody to it. Um, and it's uh, a vaccine which is delivered by having it coated in a, in a particle um, with a high fat content, which means that once it's injected, it can get across into cells, for instance, muscle cells, um, and and get those cells to produce the, the protein, um, the spike protein from the virus, which then the body responds and produces antibody to. Um, the AstraZeneca vaccine uses a, a different approach, which uses uh, a type of virus, a, a common cold virus called the adenovirus. Um, and, and that has a bit of um, viral DNA in it, which it, uh, the virus allows that to get into the cells and again, switches on the cell's machinery to, um, uh, to make that spike protein to respond to. And in both cases, the, um, uh, the material, the template material, um, you know, uh, and the virus in the case of the AstraZeneca adenovirus vaccine, they, they disappear from the body. So they're not retained and there's not any risk of them causing um, any uh, damage to any other you know, cells in the body and there's not any risk of transmitting um, infection to anyone else. So this is purely a means of allowing the body to respond to the protein on the virus to develop antibodies that are protective without being exposed to the risk of infection. Um, now it's turned out, um, and I think this in many ways is, is uh, a very reassuring story that um, because of how closely um, the, the monitoring has been done, given the fact that both these vaccines, the, the AstraZeneca using the adenovirus approach and the Pfizer vaccine using the messenger RNA approach, because these are very new approaches, even though they've looked really good in the large trials that were done, um, we really wanted to be able to look for any more rare problems that wouldn't show up in the trials by closely monitoring what happens in large populations. And as I was mentioning, you know, large countries like uh, countries in Europe and North America have given many hundreds of millions of doses. And in that context, uh, it did um, turn, uh, crop up this, uh, this rare side effect of the AstraZeneca vaccine, probably related in some way to the adenovirus, because we know that adenoviruses can cause clotting problems, rarely. Um, and so it, it is an unfortunate, I guess, unwanted um, uh, effect of the, uh, of the vaccine, which, un which fortunately is very rare. And also, I guess, now that we know about it and because we've watched carefully and found it early, we know about it, we can detect it and we know how to treat it now. And so, and so this um, 
side effect, although it sounds scary, um, is something that is both rare and treatable. Uh, on the other hand, of course, we know that COVID, you know, the COVID infection causes a lot of problems with clotting. And in fact, clotting and problems with the arteries and the heart is, is one of the major, you know, really bad effects of COVID. And so, and so compared to COVID, um, it's, very, it's a very small risk um, and balanced against the protection you get um, from uh, the vaccine against COVID, it's a very small risk. The Pfizer vaccine, on the other hand, um, turn, did turn out to have a higher rate of another rare side effect, which is anaphylaxis, you know, having an allergic reaction to the vaccine. Um, and uh, I guess the good news about that is um, all vaccinators are trained to recognise this and to be able to treat it effectively. And so even though it has been more common than, say, a flu vaccine, um, to see anaphylaxis, it's something which we can readily manage. And uh, it's actually, you know, I think New Zealand currently only has the Pfizer vaccine, and I think in many ways would like to have an alternative available like the AstraZeneca vaccine, so that if you had someone who had a, uh, a particularly a, a problem with the Pfizer vaccine, that there would be an alternative vaccine to give. Um, and I think it's, it's typical, as has happened with Fiji, to only have that one vaccine initially because supplies are short, um, but uh, I think everyone can be reassured that the, the AstraZeneca vaccine is both highly effective, particularly against severe disease, and um, balanced against the risk of the infection, very, very safe. Thank you, Peter. Uh, James, uh, back, to the, back to the PCR. Uh, so what, what does it mean uh, that you need to amplify things? So the amplification on the PCR and the next question I think connected to that about the PCR test is, uh, is there a risk of, or what's the possibility of false positive tests? Sure, so those are, uh, those are great questions. Thanks, Donald. So uh, why do we need to amplify it? We need, we need to amplify the virus uh, genome or the bit of the virus genome that we're um, detecting in our test uh, so that we can detect it. Um, if, yeah, so we, we're looking, as I, say before, as I said before, we um, can detect as little as one copy potentially of a viral genome in a, in a, in a reaction. Um, but to detect that and to be able to uh, detect that single molecule, we need to uh, firstly uh, amplify up the numbers. And so we do this through a process called polymerase. Well, there's a number of different processes, but the one that's most commonly used is the polymerase chain reaction. Um, so essentially we have um, bits of matching uh, DNA that bind to the target sequence um, and then um, make another copy of that, um, of that target sequence. And, um, and then you cycle through that again and you make copies on copies on copies of, of that uh, sequence. And then you can uh, detect that uh, using the machine by detecting the growth of the, uh, or increased numbers of, uh, of that product in the, in the reaction. So uh, with the, re the sole reason for amplification, amplification is to try and detect uh, the presence of that, uh, of that genome. As far as the uh, risk of false positives go, uh, we have, uh, in, my, in my laboratory in, in New Zealand, we have done uh, tens of thousands, probably approaching 100,000 um, tests. And uh, we've carefully follow up uh, every positive. And I can say that uh, there's probably been only two uh, samples that we thought might be false positives when we followed them up. So I think in reality, false positives are incredibly rare uh, from uh, from testing, uh, fr from this sort of testing. It's highly accurate uh, testing. Um, what there can be some confusion around is, um, in, because what the PCR is not telling you is whether the person is currently infectious or not. All it's telling you is whether there's the, the part of the genome of the virus is there. Um, and sometimes we detect the, uh, we can detect the virus at what's called a high CT value. So I, I don't know whether that's made it into the media um, in, in, in Fiji, but it's sort of become part, part of the common parlance and uh, in the media discussion about testing in, in New Zealand, uh, people wanting to know what the CT value is. And the CT value is essentially the cutoff, the number of cycles of amplification you need to do before you can detect the virus. And theoretically, 
if there was one copy in there at the start, all things being equal, you should detect it by 40 cycles. And that's usually how far these PCR tests go. Um, if we detect it very late, so if the CT value is high, that means there's not very much virus there to start with. Now that can either mean that uh, the sample wasn't, uh, wasn't a good sample. There's not a, lot of, there's not a lot of virus there. It can mean that we've detected it early in infection and the virus is on the way, the amount of virus is on the way up, or it can mean that we've detected it quite late after infection and the virus is um, on the way down. And we do see, we have seen intermittent uh, PCR positivity in people for weeks um, after acute infection. So th these are some of the, the um, uh, nuances, I guess, in, in interpreting the, uh, the, the PCR test. But the PCR, I would just reassure people that the PCR test is highly accurate. It's, it's highly sensitive. False positivity is extremely rare, um, but um, it doesn't tell you necessarily that someone's infectious. That requires interpretation in light of the exposure history, symptomatology and, and everything else. And that's really a public health, um, where the public health really comes into uh, strongly. Thanks, James. Maybe Alicia, I'll just, yeah, I think you might want to extend on that question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, in Fiji, we have six labs that currently do the uh, PCR. Uh, the open PCR, of course, is just done at Fiji CDC. The other labs all do the gene expert. And as um, James has mentioned, it's a very highly sensitive test. I'd like to talk a little bit about this amplification. You cannot amplify something that is not there in the first place. It's not creating anything new. It's just making copies of what is already there. So that is why this test is so sensitive is because you have to have something there in the first place um, to be able to find it. And um, as James mentioned about this cycle threshold and going about 40 here, we've been calling them weak positives. So if we get a, a sample that's uh, getting that CT value above 40, we call it a weak positive. Usually what we do is that we ask for a repeat sample. So we may test that same sample again and then we ask the clinician to sit, wait 24 hours and swab that person again. And then we test that sample. And then there's a decision made about whether that person actually um, can be counted as a case now, because it's likely that they might've had the disease before. And now they've just, it's just an old disease, uh, old um, infection. So we see, we saw that a lot uh, when we're doing the border quarantine testing. So when we're having repatriated citizens come in from countries with high levels of COVID cases, and they had, they likely had COVID month, even months ago, weeks ago, months ago. And the test is so sen sensitive that it's still picking up the remnants of that virus. So it's very likely not live virus, it's dead virus, but it's so sensitive that it picks that up. So in those cases, you know, we review the evidence and then you know, we repeat samples and then make a decision whether that's a false positive or not. But yes, again, after doing 150,000 tests in Fiji, we have seen that it is very rare that we actually get a false positive because this test is so sensitive and we look at things like the CT value when we're making an evaluation about whether this person actually has the disease or not. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just yeah, make the point on that as well, that um, if you're detecting something at a high CT doesn't um, uh, mean, and, the, and it's a historic infection. So if it's someone who's come through the border um, it doesn't mean it's a, a false positive. It just it, it means that they are not um, currently infectious and it's a historic infection. And, and, and we're encountering this a lot um, in New Zealand at the moment around um, people who have repatriated um, and have uh, come, uh, come back in and might have a positive test. Mm. All right, great. <clears throat> Thank you both. Uh, sorry, Anna, <laughs> I know you're waiting, but... Um, Thank you for the background you provided. So bottom line is uh, every Fijian is entitled to refuse vaccination if they so feel. Um, can an employer um, terminate the employment of an employee because they don't want to be vaccinated? What does the law say to that? Right. Uh that's a very uh, relevant question to ask. Uh, and I'm sure it's a question that's plaguing the minds of many uh, Fijians and employees at this point in time. But what we can say is that the law uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of uh, health status. And that is enshrined in our constitution. And it translates very clearly into the Employment Relations Act 
I think it's section six that uh, sets out the fundamental principles and rights that applies to workers of this country. And uh, therefore there is an onus on businesses, uh, employers, to ensure that they are very much aware of the law. And uh, even though uh, they may put in place uh, policies and processes and practices that protect uh, business interests, uh, but they also uh, must be aware that there is a constitutional law, a national law that binds them. Uh, so uh, in answer to that question, um, it, it's, it's best uh, that we recognize that there are such laws in place that prohibit discrimination on the basis of someone refusing to, refusing to, take, the, to take the vaccine, uh, which is why I had suggested earlier there may be an opportunity for striking a balance somewhere. But as far as the law is concerned, it prohibits discrimination on the basis of circumstances, health status, and uh, conscience, just to, just to name a few. And that's for, that applies to both government and non-government employees? Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, I, was, uh, I had uh, talked about the human rights uh, uh, and anti-discrimination earlier. I thought it'd be important also to mention that the the the, the, the legal role that they uh, gives them the gives them the legal authority to 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 look at private and public institutions the same. So so be that as it may, the law applies across the board, uh, regardless. All right. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, that's clear. Uh, but I think the next question is to all three of uh, so Peter, Leah, James, and Alicia. Maybe uh, you might want to take <laughs> uh, have a go at this. Explain the science behind lockdowns. Um, you know, what is the effectiveness of lockdowns uh, in terms of the control of an outbreak like COVID, and um, when should they be used? Who wants to go first? Do you want me to start? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, so just, just to give a bit of background, so Fiji, we first recorded a case of COVID in March of 2020. Then after that, we had 17 cases. They were all imported or close contacts of imported cases. The response to those cases, including finding cases, isolating them, testing them, quarantining and testing the contacts. And it was also helped because we put in movement restrictions and formation of containment areas and what are com commonly called lockdowns. That outbreak was contained within a, within a month and Fiji went an entire year without cases in the community. We were only getting cases through a border quarantine facility. Then in April, of course, we know that we had a breach in a border quarantine facility and then the Delta variant came into the community. The response to the outbreak applied the same principles that we did last year, you know, finding cases, isolating them, testing them, quarantining and testing their contacts. And it was also helped by localized movement restrictions, formation of containment areas, lockdown zones. We closed all but essential businesses and services. Schools were closed. People were asked to remain home. Um, if you did come out of your home, we asked that you wear a mask, you practice social distancing. And then there was a contact tracing app that we asked that everyone download if they have a smartphone. And in fact, entire communities that were identified as hotspots were even prevented from leaving their neighborhoods. And as you know, we all live in the, we live in the capital city, Suva. This capital city went through periods of extreme lockdowns, which what we call curfew lockdowns, for lasted as long, which lasted as long as four days. Unfortunately, even this level of lockdowns and um, our, our containment efforts has not um, contained the effort within the Lamy, Suva, Nosori area. So factors that exacerbated that spread have been mass gathering events. This is um, predominantly funerals. And unfortunately, there were large clusters formed when large essential service work groups um, got infected, and, and including our largest hospital, CWM, which now has an outbreak. So obviously now we have community transmission in the Lamy Suvanasori containment zone. Um, but in the other areas, of course, the Western Division, we're not at that level. We have cases, but they're from one cluster in the Northern Division, Eastern Division, we don't have any cases uh, reported. So the value of lockdowns really is about movement restrictions. 
stopping people from moving because we know that, as we've said a lot in Fiji, when people move, the virus move, so it moves. So it is a valuable um, tool in our toolbox of containing um, not just this virus, but other viruses as well. For example, when we had meningococcal C outbreak in 2018, measles outbreak in 2019, we also had some level of reducing mass gatherings. But what we've seen with this outbreak is that we have been through certain forms of these lockdowns, but unfortunately there has been um, coincidental, I guess, events where we had mass gatherings that have exacerbated the, the infection, the outbreak itself. And the effect has been that the outbreak has still been growing despite all of these measures. And we're coming to a point now where from the health perspective, yes, lockdowns are an important tool, but it's also, we've come to a limit of applying those lockdowns because of the impact that it has on our community. So the lockdowns that in Fiji that we're used to are the curfew lockdown. That is our most extreme level of lockdown. And that's actually never been applied in Australia or New Zealand. You know, there's always been a level of, you can go and go to the supermarket and get food. But our curfew lockdowns in the central division that lasted up to four days, no one could actually leave their houses. So we've reached a limit where the impact of a lockdown would actually be quite um, very extreme on the population themselves. And we're seeing that um, in the community. So from the health side, while we do know that it's a very, it's a very important tool, we also understand that there are other factors that come into play when making this decision, decision at the national level that may mean that lockdowns are no longer a tool that we can use. But all, yeah, but definitely lockdowns have always been a, um, a tool that we would like to use. Uh, we have used in the past, but we also have to base our response on the reality on the ground and the effect that it has on the population. And, and Donald, if I could come in following Alicia's comments, I think um, in a sense what she's highlighting is proportionality. You know, that, the, that given all the, you know, other problems and issues that lockdowns of various severity cause, it has to be proportionate to the problem you're trying to solve. And I think in the pre-vaccine world, um, you know, there was uncertainty about this, you know, last year. But I think now it's becoming pretty clear that the approach that Fiji, New Zealand and Australia, uh, other Pacific countries took of going for zero COVID uh, essentially trying to keep the virus out altogether, seems to have turned out to be on balance the most successful approach in a pre-vaccine world. And I think that's the exciting thing about moving to a post-vaccine world. You know, we've seen, you know, countries much worse affected like the US reaching the point where they say, well, look, if you're vaccinated, you can go to the mass gatherings, you can do these other things. Um, and of course, it's raised this issue about vaccine passports and do we agree with them? Personally, I do agree with them, but I can see that there are other people who may, may have reservations. But I think the exciting thing about it is that vaccines are our tool to get out of this pickle in terms of having that, you know, that was really the only measure we could employ to keep people safe and with vaccines, we don't. We will not need to do that, or not need to do it in the same way. So I think I think that's a really important point to remember, particularly as Fiji is in the middle of you know an outbreak, which is obviously causing a lot of difficulty and distress for a lot of people. Exactly, Peter, and thank you for bringing that up. That so that's one key tool that we didn't have last year when we tackled our first wave. We did not have an effective vaccine in Fiji. The world didn't have an effective vaccine. Now we do, and we've used vaccines very effectively in outbreaks of other diseases. I mentioned for meningococcal C in 2018, then measles in 2019. The reasons those outbreaks were brought under control was yes, we did contact tracing, we did isolation and quarantine, but the vaccine was eventually what contained those outbreaks. And this, this is what we will be relying on for this outbreak as well. So now um, over 40% of Fiji's population has now received at least one dose of the AstraZeneca vac vaccine. And that number is only increasing. All right, James? I, I, no, yeah, I just agree with the uh, comments made by uh, Peter and Alicia. And I mean, I think I'd also add that as is evident by what's happening in Fiji at the moment and, and what's happening in Melbourne, um, maintaining sort of strict border controls in the long term is not feasible. And I mean, obviously it has significant economic 
um, and social impact as well. Um, so I think that um, now that we have effective vaccines, uh, they are the, the way forward. Once we open our borders, the virus is going to come. And even when we try to keep our borders closed, the virus manages to squeeze through um, on occasions. Um, so I think we uh, going forward, the best way to protect ourselves and importantly, the best way to protect others in the community is to, uh, is to get vaccinated. Awesome, thank you. Anna, well, is, there an, is there a legal angle to lockdowns? Uh, you don't have to answer, but if do you think there is something uh, in terms of human rights to the lockdown issue? Uh, obviously, uh, the Constitution does guarantee uh, our freedom of movement, and uh, uh, we understand that uh, government has made decisions in the past and imposed lockdowns. I think one of the important uh, things that need to that that we have learned uh, from past uh, experience is the need to give uh, sufficient notice, I suppose, uh, to the members of the public. Um, but the the point remains that government, when through the public health officials, when it's making such drastic and what appears to be draconian in some uh, perspective uh, is necessary for the protection of uh, the public interest and the public at large. So it's always uh, decisions that are made uh, for the promotion and the protection of the public interest. Uh, obviously, there will always be uh, some perspectives that uh, differ from the decision that's been taken. But uh, ultimately, the law, Constitution of Fiji 2013, uh, guarantees uh, our freedom of movement as one of the fundamental rights that exists. So I don't know whether that's helpful to yeah. this discussion, but that's certainly the, uh, the legal position. But, so Anna, how would that impact in Fiji under the Constitution with the idea of vaccine passports having something on your phone or some proof of vaccination allowing you to do certain things? How would that, how would that play out for Fiji? Well, I think uh, the biggest hurdle, if that was a plan or a path that uh, the public of, uh, health officials would want to take, the hurdle that they would have in front of them would be the constitutional provisions that uh, basically uh, guarantee some of the very fundamental rights. Uh, and it's probably going to uh, affect the right to freedom, to privacy, or the right to privacy. Uh, so that in my mind at this point in time would be the hurdle that stands uh, in the path of the public health officials should they want to go down that path. And uh, uh, it's more, of an, uh, a privacy question, whether uh, I uh, should allow the state to be aware of where I'm going and what I'm doing. So, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an important uh, uh, consideration, but uh, if there is one hurdle that stands in the way it would be the constitutional uh, fundamental freedoms that I enshrined in the constitution. Thank you, Anna. Uh, maybe to Peter and James, Alicia can also jump in if you feel. Uh, why do some patients who test positive uh, not have symptoms? Uh, oh, well, I mean, James might be the best person yeah. to, to answer that. Um, I mean, I can have a go, but I think James will be able to. Yeah, go ahead, James. Sure. Um, look, I mean, I, I think that's a tricky question to answer, and I don't think we entirely um, know the uh, know, know the, the the biological explanation for that. Um, we do know that about maybe a third of people um, uh, may be asymptomatic. Um, I mean, it varies depending upon on the studies. Um, the virus is able to replicate um, throughout the respiratory tract, so both in the upper uh, respiratory tract, the na nasopharynx, so the nose, back of the nose, back of the throat as well as in the lower respiratory tract. Um, if the immune response 
um, particularly uh, the early innate immune response is able to control, adequately control the uh, virus replication, uh, then we may not um, have enough uh, tissue damage or enough inflammatory mediators released to um, cause, us, cause us symptoms. So it probably relates to um, the degree of um, uh, early control of virus replication um, uh, and the signals that are provided by the innate immune response that um, determine whether we develop symptoms. And I don't know, Peter, if you've got any other. Yeah, the, well, I suppose I could just add to that by, by pointing out the comparator of influenza. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, not, it's something that a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate, but, but it's well documented in uh, clinical trials in particular that you know, there are a lot of people who get asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic influenza. I mean, the classic flu that we all think of as being you know, laid out in bed with a high fever and, you know, dreaming of whatever um, for a couple of days is, you know, there's a lot of people who don't get that kind of severity. But the thing that's been really, I think, interesting and important about, um, about the SARS-CoV-2 virus has been that children, particularly young children, um, seem to be uh, much less likely to get infected. And if they are infected, much less likely to transmit than you know, teenagers, young adults, older adults. And uh, there are various theories about that, but um, it is a really important difference with, uh, the, you know, with influenza where school children were kind of the engine room, I suppose, in many, in many contexts of, of spreading influenza and other respiratory viruses. And that does not seem to be the case for, uh, for this, uh, you know, coronavirus and probably for the other, because there have been other coronaviruses around, you know, the ones that have um, uh, just caused, for the most part, fairly mild uh, cold type symptoms. Um, but yeah, this is a, it's a key difference with um, uh, COVID and flu. And I think it has implications for how we handle things in terms of, you know, going down uh, the age groups. Yeah, I'd probably just jump in as well. Um, so particularly in Fiji, when we say, well, locally, when we say we've got the flu, it's taken as a very mild disease. It's essentially a cold. When someone says they have the flu, normally it's a cold that they're talking about. But we know that the flu itself has caused pandemics in the past. We know that this, this virus, the COVID-19, which is not a flu, is more infectious than influenza, the, uh, the common influenza that we have around. And it also causes more deaths than, than influenza. We know this, but we also know that it's, um, I guess in a way you could say these viruses that cause pandemics are tricky. It's a balance between causing just enough deaths and as well as being able to be transmitted to more and more people. So if a virus is too deadly, it will die out pretty quite quickly because it kills a host quite fast. So this is something you learn about viruses. So there are diseases that are much more cause um, much more deaths, but because they kill out these populations very fast, like things like Ebola, uh, rabies, I think is the most the one disease that has the highest case fatality, but it doesn't spread very far because it's so it causes so many deaths. But if you get a virus like COVID, where it's very infectious, and it is it causes just enough deaths to be a problem, a public health problem. This is when you get something like a pandemic. And this is, um, I, I think the uh, local example I can give is for meningococcal C in 2018. When, when we had that outbreak, we had just a, about um, 85 cases and we had six deaths. And we can look at COVID-19 in Fiji so far, we've had over a thousand cases and four deaths that are attributed to this disease. But the problem with this one, this disease is that it's caused a pandemic over 3 million people have died worldwide because it's so transmissible. It's just got that balance right where it's got that high level of transmissibility and it kills just enough people and hospitalizes enough people where it can actually overwhelm healthcare systems. And it has in some of the most developed countries um, in the world. So just because you may get, there are a lot of people who get COVID and get mild disease, it doesn't mean that just your experience means that everyone is going to go through that experience. There are a percentage of people who will get severe disease. So it's sort of taken that about one to 2% generally across populations in the world will die from COVID-19. So if you take just a hundred people, that's one to two people. But as you get more and more and more people getting COVID, that one to 2% grows to these very, very large numbers. So now 
3 million people, over 3 million people worldwide have died because so many people have gotten the disease. Yes, but I, I suppose the other thing to add to that, Alicia, is that Fiji is, I guess, in, in a slightly better situation than countries like Australia and New Zealand in terms of not having so many people who have the major risk factor for dying from COVID, which is being over 60. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are few, fewer people in, in Fiji in that age group. And uh, uh, the, uh, the thing about the, the virus is that it, it's actually not interested in killing people. It's interested in spreading and, and multiplying. And so I think it's important to keep that in mind when we hear about all the variants, you know, that the variants are mainly um, what they're doing is typically developing better ways of spreading and infecting other populations. That, uh, whereas if, you're, if that's happening in a highly vaccinated population, um, what we're finding is that even though the vaccines may have been developed against the original virus, not the variant virus, that, that the vaccine you receive for the original virus is still protecting you against severe disease. It might not be protecting you against in, getting infected by the new variant, but it's still protecting you against severe disease. And so if we can have you know, high, vaccin high vaccination rates, particularly of our most vulnerable people um, in the population, then we have much less to worry about in terms of you know, variants coming along and so on, because we can say, okay, as James was mentioning down the track, it's very hard to see that we won't have the uh, COVID viruses circulating as we have other respiratory viruses. But if we have that happening in the context of a well-protected uh, particularly vulnerable population, um, so that we're not seeing those high rates of severe illness and death, then obviously that's a very different scenario to uh, what we've been dealing with and why we've been, you know, um, going so hard against this virus as we have been in the pre-vaccine era. But the post-vaccine era, I think we can look forward to a different situation. Yeah, I'll probably jump in again there. So yes, in Fiji we have a younger population. Um, but one thing, uh, one factor as well that we know we have is that we have quite a, um, a high number of people with comorbidities. So chronic diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, obesity. And we know that those are also risk factors for severe disease. So, so far, while we haven't been seeing that wave of severe disease that we expect, um, we know that we have that underlying risk factor for a big uh, proportion of our population which is why we are really, really asking anybody, you know, please, everybody in Fiji, please get vaccinated because we do need to protect everybody. You know, right now we may have young people getting, getting the virus, but they're spreading it. They're spreading it within their household, within their villages, within their communities, and they will spread it to people who have these, these conditions, these chronic conditions. And if they get the virus, they have a much higher risk of getting the severe form of um, the illness that the virus cause, causes. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, it, it's unfortunate. Time has caught up on us. There's uh, still a list of questions that we haven't answered. Um, and so, unfortunately, uh, to those of you that are connecting, uh, we will have to round off our discussion today. Um, what we'll do is we'll send the list of questions that are still pending to the panelists, and uh, we'll just request them to jot down their thoughts. And, uh, but once again, we just want to thank uh, the four panelists with us today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, James. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you, Anna, uh, for uh, joining us today. And uh, for, uh, for those of you that are listening in, we've got a, um, uh, another panel coming up on Thursday uh, in the Fijian language. It's okay. On, so there's two on Thursday and Friday. There's another English one coming up next Monday and on Tuesday. So just uh, keep a look out for the flyers and the links that we will continue with these sessions. So once again, everyone, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And again, a uh, big unaka wakalewo to our four panelists. Uh, do take care, everyone. Unaka. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye -bye. Yeah, thank you.